I'm Pastor John Baird, and I want to welcome you to the Way of the Word Ministries television ministry. As always, I'm honored to be here with each and every one of you sharing God's Word. And we are still in our study of the book of John. This is message number 11. Today we're going to be in the book of John, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. There was a preacher in a little town, and he was going to have to be out of the pulpit for a couple of months because he was going to have some surgery, and he didn't have an assistant pastor. As a matter of fact, there wasn't another pastor for miles around, but he did have a teenager that was over his youth group, and so he asked this teenager if he'd fill in for him while he was off, and the teenager reluctantly Agreed. And so that first Sunday for him to fill in came and he got up in front of the church and he was so nervous. His knees weren't just knocking. They were passing each other. Anyway, he looks out at the congregation and he says, does anybody know what I'm going to talk about today? No one said a thing. And he said, well, I don't either. So church dismissed. (laughs) So the next Sunday comes and this poor young teenager, he's still just as nervous. He gets back up there in front of the congregation and he looks out at everybody and he says, does anybody know what I'm going to talk about today? Well, they were all ready for him this time. So they all raised their hands up and he said, well, good. Since you all already know, church dismissed. So... The third Sunday comes, and by now word had spread around about this young man's strange behavior, and the church was filled up, standing room only. They had to open the window so the people outside uh, could hear what was going on. And this young man, still just as nervous, he gets up in front of the church and he says, does anybody know what I'm going to talk about today? Well, this time some of the people raised their hands and others just sat there uh, quietly. And he said, great. Those of you who know, uh, please tell those who don't. (laughs) And, And as funny as that story is, the truth is that third Sunday, that last message he spoke, It really spoke volumes. He said, those of you who know, please tell those who don't. The reason that third message spoke volumes is because that is a perfect definition of evangelism. Those of us who know Jesus should be telling everybody out there who doesn't know Jesus. Now, this is our second message from the third chapter of the Gospel of John. And this third chapter of John's Gospel is really one of the most evangelistic uh, chapters in all of the Bible. And in our last message, the last time we were together, we met a guy by the name of Nicodemus. He was one of those Jewish religious leaders from back there in the first century. And he was a very, very important person. He came to visit Jesus at night because he didn't want the other Jewish religious leaders to see him talking to Jesus. But again, he was really an important person. If he was in our world today, he would be sort of a cross between a U.S. senator and a Supreme Supreme Court judge. He had a lot of questions for Jesus, but Jesus told Nicodemus, hey, Nicodemus, your religion, your nationality, your family, none of that will get you into heaven. In the third verse of John chapter 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. 
And what we learned in our last message was that if you're only born once, if you're only born physically, well, you're going to die twice. You're going to die physically, and then later you're going to suffer what the Bible, the book of Revelation, calls the second death. And that's God's judgment against everyone that rejects him. But if you're born twice, first physically and then later you're born again uh, spiritually, well, then you're only going to die uh, once. And after that, you're going to spend eternity with Jesus. You'll only die once, barring the rapture of the church. That means that there are people out there who will never taste death. They'll never experience death because they're going to be uh, raptured. Those will be all the believers who are alive when Jesus comes to meet everybody in the sky. That's not the second coming of Jesus. That's the rapture of the church. Anyway, we learned that if you're born once, you'll die twice. But if you're born twice, barring the rapture, you'll only die once. I know that whole thing sounds kind of convoluted, but it makes perfect sense to anyone who studies the Bible. Now, we stopped our last message right in the middle of this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. We're going to pick that back up today. And in this conversation, in this part of the conversation, Jesus is going to refer to an unusual Old Testament event to illustrate what it means to be born again. So let's check it out right now. The book of John chapter 3 verses 14 and 15. Jesus told Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, some of you are no doubt familiar with this fascinating true account from the life of Moses. But just in case you've forgotten some of the details, we're going to check it out again here right now in the book of Numbers. But before we dive into that, let me just kind of set it up for you. We're going to see the Israelites. This is that point where they're wandering around uh, in the desert. They've been out there for almost 40 years now, and their favorite pastime was complaining and criticizing not just Moses, but God himself. Check it out. The book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 5 through 9. It says, The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you led us up from Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread or water, and we detest this wretched food. That was the manna God provided for them. Then the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and they bit them so that many of the Israelites died. Then the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Intercede with the Lord so that he will take the snakes away from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a snake image and mount it on a pole. When anyone who is bitten looks at it, they will recover. So Moses made a bronze snake and mounted it on a pole. Whenever someone was bitten and they looked at the bronze snake, they recovered. Now a snake coiled around a pole is still used in our world today as a symbol for medical care or pharmacy. Sometimes there's two snakes wrapped around a pole. One snake wrapped around a pole is called the rod of Asclepius. Asclepius has a long E in his name. He was the Greek god of medicine and two snakes wrapped around a pole is called the rod of Hermes. But it doesn't matter whether there's just one snake on the pole or two snakes on the pole. The roots of that symbol, they go all the way back to Moses and the Israelites out there in the desert. Moses was around long before Greek mythology. And the snake on the pole account, it might have just remained one of many obscure Old Testament accounts. But Jesus gave it prominent standing when he mentioned it to Nicodemus in their conversation. And what Jesus was telling Nicodemus was, hey, Nicodemus, there's a connection between what Moses did with that snake on a pole and what's going to happen when I'm lifted up on the cross. It was a salvation lesson for Nicodemus, and it's a salvation lesson for all of us as well. So let's learn four practical lessons about salvation from our verses today. Number one, as sinners, we are under the curse of death. Those Israelites, when they were out there in the desert, they were really a bunch of whiners. And I know it sounds like I'm picking on them, but the book of Numbers just told us that they were constantly complaining about God and against uh, Moses. And according to our verses, they were longing for the good old days back in Egypt, you know, 
when they were slaves. The truth is, the good old days were never really as good as we remember them to be. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 10 says, Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Think about the fact that those Israelites had been marching around out there in the desert for almost 40 years on a trip that should have only taken them three or four months from the place they left Egypt at to the place they called the promised land. It should have only taken three or four months. But God had them marching around out there in the desert to try and cure them of not just their self-pride, but their unbelief. Now, out there in the desert, there isn't any food, right? There aren't any animals to hunt. There's no ponds filled with fish out there in the desert. Can't grow food out there in the desert. And so every day, every morning when they woke up, God provided manna on the ground for them to eat. And it wasn't like they just ate it the same way every day. This was a very versatile kind of food. They could do all kind of different things with it. But now here they are. They're complaining about the manna. In other words, they're complaining about food from heaven given to them by God. So here they are, they're complaining, and now God, he sends poisonous snakes into the camp. They start biting people, and people start dying. And as Christians, when we read something like that, we really have to stop and scratch our heads a little bit and say, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like the God we serve. He doesn't kill people just because they complain or grumble. But remember, Israel is God's chosen nation. The scripture tells us God chose the nation of Israel. Look at Acts chapter 13, verse 17. It says, The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an high arm brought he them out of it. Sometimes when Christians hear that, when they hear that God chose the nation of Israel, they somehow think that they're supposed to exalt the nation of Israel. But they weren't chosen to be put on a pedestal. They were chosen to be an example of what it would take to please God through the law. That's the Ten Commandments, through works. Their negative attitude was only the outward symptom of their deeper sin of unbelief. That's why they were wandering around out here in the desert in the first place, because years earlier at a place called Kadesh Barnea, they had expressed their unbelief by saying that God couldn't give them victory over the giants in the land. The book of Numbers again, chapter 14, verses 2 through 4. And the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. So there they are, longing for the good old days right there. And at that point, they had hardly even begun their journey through the desert. But they weren't just mad because they had been wandering through the hot, sandy desert for a while. No, these Israelites, they were wandering around in the desert of a discontent. And there are a lot of people in our world today who've been snake bitten with a spirit of discontent. And unfortunately, in our world today, Social media has given all of us a platform where we can sit and gripe and complain and criticize other people to our heart's discontent. And we never even have to confront the person who's the subject of our dissatisfaction. But the book of Timothy chapter 6 verse 6 says that godliness with contentment is great gain. And when Paul wrote Philippians 4.13, where he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He wasn't talking about winning a football game or getting a job. He was talking about Jesus giving him the power to be cheerfully content, even when he was shipwrecked or in prison or bitten by a poisonous snake himself or stoned to within inches of his life three different times. And just like theirs was a correlation between 
between those snake bites and death in the camp, the book of James tells us that there's a direct correlation between sin and death. And in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, James shows us the steps of the deadly spiral of sin. James says, but each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. The truth is, all of us come into this world having been snake-bitten by the sin of unbelief. The deadly venom of unbelief, it courses through our veins. And if it remains untreated by a cure, it's going to lead to eternal death. That's number one. As sinners, all of us are under the curse of death. And the second lesson we can learn from our verses today is, in His grace, God has provided a cure. So this swarm of snakes comes into the camp, man. They're slithering around everywhere. And I'm sure the Israelites probably tried to fight them off somehow. Maybe they took brooms and they tried to sweep them over this way. But the ones over here probably came and bit them from that way. There were just too many snakes. They were all over the camp. And so finally, man, the Israelites, they recognized their sin. They repented. They went to Moses. And in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verse 7, we're told they said to Moses, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Intercede with the Lord so that he will take the snakes away from us. So they didn't blame God or Moses this time. Instead, they repented and they asked God for help. And even though elsewhere in the scriptures we're told that Moses was really upset about now with all of their complaining, he went to the Lord on their behalf and he prayed. Now, I'm sure those Israelites, I'm sure they wanted God to take those snakes away like right now, poof, bam, they're gone. But God didn't take away the snakes right away. He did something better. God gave them a cure that was so powerful, it wouldn't just heal them from their snake bites. It would serve as a powerful symbol, a powerful example of salvation for all the years to come. And the truth be told, sometimes we want God to take away the pain quickly too, but instead He does something bigger and better in us. And this is really one of the best examples of God's grace in the entire Old Testament. These people who, just like us, had a proven track record of rebellion and unbelief and nagging, they didn't deserve a cure. But because it's God's nature, He graciously provided them with a cure. He had Moses make an image of a snake and put it on a pole. And God said, whoever looks at that snake on the pole will be healed. And again, just like those Israelites, before we can find a cure for sin, we have to repent. We have to admit we've sinned. We have to seek God. And then we have to trust ourselves to God's cure. None of us deserves God's forgiveness, but that's what grace is. It's God giving us what we need rather than what we deserve. In the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 8, we're told, but God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus told Nicodemus that that bronze snake that Moses lifted up there in the desert was a symbol of who he, Jesus himself, is and what he would do on the cross. Now, stop for a second and think about the fact that Jesus in these verses is comparing himself to a snake. Why would he do that? No one likes to be compared to a snake, right? If someone in Islam, if they compared Muhammad to a snake, they'd be charged with blasphemy. And in other countries, they'd be beheaded. And you and I, we don't like being called a snake, right? Somebody says, hey, you snake, you snake in the grass. Old JB here, I've been called a snake in the grass more than once in my life, more than twice in my life, and I probably deserved it more times than not. But nonetheless, Jesus, our Lord, Savior, and King, he self-identifies with this snake here in our verses. Again, why would he do that? Well, the answer is found all the way back in the Garden of Eden, right? That's where we see Satan. He comes into the garden after entering what's called a serpent, some form of 
of lizard. He comes into the Garden of Eden. He tempts Eve and he tempts Adam uh, through Eve. And after that took place, an amazing transference took place. Check it out with me here in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. It says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you'll eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed, that's the children of the devil, and her seed. He, Jesus the seed, will crush your head and you, Satan, will strike his heel. Wow, what's that all about, Pastor John? Well, again, Satan, he came into the Garden of Eden after he had entered into a serpent, some form of a lizard. And because that serpent, because he let Satan enter him and use him, he crawled back out of that garden as a snake. He lost his legs, not just he himself, but all his descendants after him. And on the cross, Jesus, he took the near fatal strike of the snake. But at that same moment, he took his heel and he crushed the head of the snake. How did he do that? Well, look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, God made him, that's Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, he defeated sin, death, the devil, and the grave when he died on the cross. And that's number two. In his grace, God provided a cure. And number three, God's cure must be lifted up. God told Moses to make the image of a snake and put it high up on a pole where everybody could see it. A snake, the one thing that had been the cause of so much death there in the camp. God wanted everyone to be able to look and live. And when you and I, when we look at the cross and we think to ourselves, hey man, Jesus, he hung on a cross just like that one. And when he hung there, he took the sins of the world, past, present, and future on himself. Your sins and my sins, the sin that has caused so much death. And now because of that, all you and I, all of us who've been snake bitten by sin, all we have to do is look to Jesus, trust him and we can live. That's what Jesus meant when he talked about being lifted up. And Jesus, he made another reference to this in the book of John, chapter eight, verse 28. Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. But as my father taught me, I speak these things in the book of John, chapter 12, verse 32. Jesus said, and when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. And look again at verse 14 of our verses. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. But this lifting up of Jesus, it wasn't just confined to the cross. The book of Acts and the epistles, they tell us that Jesus was lifted up in other ways. After Jesus died physically on the cross and he was placed in that tomb, again, he was lifted up from the grave. And we're told that Jesus walked this earth for 40 days and that over 500 people saw him. And after that, he was lifted up into heaven. And the book of Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 says, Therefore God has exalted him. God has lifted him up to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. God, he lifted Jesus up to the highest place. It says it right there. And our job as Jesus' followers is to go out there and lift Jesus up to this lost, fallen, and dying world. We have to lift up the message of the gospel to lost people out there. We live in a world today where there are billions of people walking around out there that have been snake bitten by sin. That's our job, number three, to lift lift up God's cure. And the main takeaway from the message today and our last point for the day, number four, 
is we only have to look to the cross and believe to have life. Listen to the words of Jesus from verses 14 and 15 of our verses today. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Those snake-bitten Israelites, they were given healing and they were given physical life. Of course, eventually they were going to die again. But Jesus says, whoever looks to the cross in faith and believes, they will have eternal life with him. Now, I want you to notice that God didn't tell Moses to bow down before the snake. God didn't say bring an offering to the snake or make a sacrifice to the snake. All God said was, look at the snake. I'm sure that Moses lifted that snake on the pole up high enough, tall enough in the camp that no matter where you were in the camp, all you had to do was look over and you could see that snake on a pole. All they had to do was look and live. And it's the same for us when we look to the redeeming work of Jesus on the cross on our behalf. Now, unfortunately, some people out there They look at not only the true account of the snake on the pole, but the true account of Jesus on the cross as nothing more than a myth, a fable or a a fairy tale. Why is that? Well, as always, the Bible gives us the answer. Look at the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 18 through 20. It says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And when this verse right here, when it uses that terminology to us who are being saved, it's talking about the sanctification process. It's not talking about salvation because anyone, everyone who receives Jesus, they're saved the very moment that they receive Jesus once and for all. They're saved for all time. They're not going to lose their salvation. But the message of the cross continues to grow us. All you had to do the day you were were saved was to look to the cross of Jesus and believe God. And immediately from the inside out, God began a spiritual healing process in your life. All you had to do was look and live. Each one of us as a follower of Jesus is proof of Jesus. So a little side note here before we close, what ended up happening to that snake on a stick? Well, Those Israelites, they carried it into the promised land with them. And it was still around 800 years later when Hezekiah was king. The problem was the Israelites, they began to worship the snake on the stick. They began to bow down before it. And that's idol worship. And God doesn't like idol worship. And we're told in 2 Kings chapter 18 verse 4 that King Hezekiah, he broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. It was called Nehushtan. And those parentheses are in your Bible. And that word Nehushtan is a Hebrew word that means piece of bronze. Hezekiah named it Nehushtan to remind the people that it was only that, a piece of bronze. It had no power in it. Even in the Numbers 21 incident, it was God that healed the people, not a piece of bronze. And Nehushtan, it should be a powerful reminder to all of us today that even good things or good people, they can become idols in our lives. But our praise and our adoration and our worship it belongs to God and to God alone nothing else is worthy no matter how amazing the history of it is and for us today Nehushtan it could actually be the cross I mean it's okay if you want to put a bumper sticker on your car with a cross on it or wear a beautiful piece of jewelry around your neck with a a cross on it or have a picture of the cross in your house but don't ever make the mistake of worshiping the cross or worshiping a, a crucifix there's a difference between the two, by the way. The crucifix has Jesus on it and the 
the, the cross is always empty. But don't make the mistake of worshiping those things. Those things are only reminders of the redeeming work of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that's Jesus. He and he alone deserves again our adoration, our praise and worship. You see, as Christians, we don't worship symbols. We look toward the substance. Look and live. It's all about a look. Think about the power of a look. All our problems began with a look. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. It's all about the fall. It says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Eve looked at that fruit in the garden, saw that it was good for food, and that's why we're in the condition that we're in today. But then in the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 22, God said, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Later in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 2, we're told to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And because of that, the book of Titus chapter 2 verse 13 says that we should look forward to the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. It's all about a look. Hey, look and live until the next time you and I meet here on the Way the Word Ministries television program. May God bless you. May God keep you. And may God grant each and every one of you the desires of your heart all in Jesus' mighty name. Until then, I'll see you later, everybody. Bye-bye.